Hello, and um, welcome to my second response video. And this video really came from a four-day training um, that I took part in uh, that was led by um, let's see, Robert J. Garmston and Bruce Wallman. Uh, they, one of the resources provided it to us was um, the book that they wrote, co-wrote, um, called The Adaptive School, a source book for developing collaborative groups. And they were chosen as the presenters for um, required facilitation, facilitation training offered by my agency, offered by Prairie Lakes AEA. Um, and it was one of several strands that we could, we've been um, part of over the past three years. One of the things that kept catching me was they kept talking about group norms. They were talking about norms and communication. They've been talking, they were talking a lot about people's perceptions of norms. Um, and particularly, one of the things that kept coming up, depending on your generation, was texting during a meeting, having a, a laptop open during a meeting, typing during a meeting. Um, some of the use of technology kinds of things and the perceptions around those in addition to ha the quality of communication. Um, and I wanted to start out by saying that really one of the things that has captured me uh, or that is, has inspired me a little bit is this whole idea of what is the norm. When I, um, way back in my first master's degree, had taken um, family systems theory, an advanced family systems class, one of the things that they were talking about was the idea that what is the normal family system? We talk about nuclear families, in other words, biological mom, biological dad, biological kids, all living in the same household um, with nobody else other than those joined either by marriage or by genetics. and. One of the things that had come up was the idea that the divorce rate was over 50% now. So can we call the nuclear family the norm, as opposed to reinvented or reimagined families or whatever buzzword that you want to use other than broken families? Um, and if that's the norm, then does our system truly designed and truly reflect the supports that were necessary um, does, does family therapy even have the tools necessary to work with what is now a normal family? Well, the same idea came to me as we were looking at this idea of diverse learner needs. Um, we categorize, as I had said in my introductory video. We say they're ELL, they're behavior disabilities, they're mentally ill, they are GTA. Um, all of these different um, or GT, in need of GT. All of these different acronyms and labels that we've tossed around, even though we're non-categorical, supposedly. We are students, uh, at least for special education purposes in my agency, are either entitled or not entitled. Um, they aren't labeled with any particular um, disability. And so I thought it was really interesting as they were talking repeatedly about the research, the research. And it came to me that a lot of this research for not just adult learners um, hadn't caught up yet. It was really t coming out of the 90s, um, sometimes the late 80s. It was good stuff, but does it applicable now? I think it's very similar with our instructional methodology. Is it really true that uh, the instructional, the traditional instructional methods that we employ reach still the majority of learners? Or is the norm now the 21st century learner? And is part of the issue and one of the reasons that differentiated instruction and at-risk programs and all of these different sorts of things, all of these um, positive behavior supports school-wide is just huge. Kids don't want to do homework. Kids won't participate in class. Kids are apathetic. Is it that, or are, is our system just continually trying to pound square pegs into round holes? And as we were talking, and there were several generational differences, one of the things that the facilitators, um, as I said, kept coming back to was this whole idea of um, group norms. And so, one of the things that we were talking about was this full attentiveness. 
um, teachers, you hear, you know, this huge boom of people uh, being concerned about ADHD and ADD and that it's all related to attentiveness. Well, the tech generation toggles pretty quickly. Uh, one of the things that I had pointed out or questioned the um, facilitators about was this idea that you can't have your laptop open. You can't have your cell phone on silent next to you, where I feel a little lost without all those things going, so I was questioning that. I'm pointing out that me and my friends and my daughters and their friends um, about 38 and below, roughly. Um, of course, that's a real rough estimate for the um, sort of tech generation. Um, we are very comfortable having multiple laptops open in a room, cell phones going off, um, and conversation occurring. And if you were to ask any of us, we would probably say that even though it's social, it's fairly productive. This is not the when you hit a certain generational level, they don't consider that possible. And one of the things they pointed out was that multitasking is a myth. Um, there's the idea that the human brain can only really process one piece of information at a time. It can be a complex piece of information, but only really one. And that you um, don't actually think about several things. Multitasking doesn't happen the way we thought it did. It's toggling. You toggle very quickly back and forth and back and forth to, to, from one activity to another. The presenter brought up some of the brain theory, the, the brain um, based research that's going on right now. Not the traditional brain based learning stuff where we're looking at learning styles or, you know, we're looking at people crossing their hands and things like that, but looking at the physical changes that growing up in the information age and the age of technology age of concepts really has had on um, students, students functioning, students abilities, um, and um, how students learn, how kids today learn. I wouldn't be, of course, part of that generation. However, I started thinking about the idea that, of this toggling and how I hear sometimes from people that rely on a real traditional model that, well, how can you, you can't say you multitask. You can't sit there and say you're paying attention because you're, you can't, you're, you're toggling. And, and my theory is that we toggle pretty fast and we, have, we can be trained to toggle pretty fast. Now, it may be true if I am reading a sentence, I can't be listening at the same time. I think that we can train ourselves to pick up snippets and then, or to read a sentence and go back and forth very quickly. Think about those laser pointers that write words or sentences or draw shapes. It may be one laser beam that can write a short word, but the word will appear as a solid thing, even though that laser beam is only at one point at a time. It can appear as if, though, it's in many places at once. I would argue that it may be possible that, especially students and people even younger than I, not only um, are they toggling? They're toggling fast enough that it almost appears as if they do have the ability to multitask. And when we're looking as educators, whether it's as adult educators in a system that is now filling up more and more with millennials in the workplace and Generation Xers, is it possible that we need to re-examine what the entire norm is as far as what we consider productive communication, productive learning, um, and productive participation. I will talk a little bit more um, at length about some of the 21st century learning as we talk about some of the rest of the uh, videos, but I wanted to um, at least throw that out there, this idea that maybe um, the norm has become diverse learning needs because there is such a disconnect between who our system was designed to teach and who, in fact, we are actually educating.